Hey everyone, back tuning in to my latest El Nino video. I uh, uploaded an El Nino video to the website uh, over the weekend. I wasn't happy with it, I've taken it down and uh, I'm going to have another go. I made a few errors, including one very uh, serious glaring error. Uh, no idea why I did it. Uh, I didn't know that I was doing it at the time. Uh, it just sort of came out. Uh, but I couldn't, in all conscience, let the video uh, stick around website and YouTube, uh, knowing that the information in that uh, video, uh, or at least part of the information in that video, uh, was very wrong. So I took it down, and I'm redoing it now. I uh, hope you find this uh, ENSO update just as interesting as the first one. Probably didn't see uh, the first one on Sunday. It was only up uh, for a couple of hours. Things getting very interesting in the Pacific, and we'll have a look at what's going on in a moment. But I just want to mention the advertising. There's video ads on my pages at gasweblist.com. You press play on the video ad, you'll be supporting gasweblist.com. Thanks very much for doing that. And just say that all the charts that you see in this video, you can find the links to them on my uh, links page. So you can see all of the things in this video for yourself. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what uh, El Nino is, and I'm going to get rid of the camera so you can see this. El Nino is a warming of the uh, ocean along the equatorial Pacific from Peru to Indonesia. And this example from a 1998, a so-called mega El Nino event, this one is a pretty good example. This very vibrant red area stretched out from Peru along uh, the equatorial Pacific, uh, along the equator, is uh, a very classic uh, signature for an El Nino. As the warm water rises up to the surface, it spreads out along the equator, and uh, that is a classic El Nino signal. And the mistake I was making in the third video is that I was talking about this area along the equator as the date line. Of course, it isn't the date line. The date line is running south to north from the poles. Uh, so I was completely wrong with that. I did know that information, but for some reason, it was just coming out uh, that the equatorial Pacific was the date line. It isn't the date line. This is the equator date line. Runs south to north equator. Runs east to west. I couldn't let the video uh, stay around uh, with something as glaring as that in it. So, yeah, that's El Nino. Uh, a very classic uh, signature for an El Nino event. And that's the strongest recorded El Nino on record. The event of 97, 1998. There's also, of course, La Nina, and La Nina is the complete reversal of El Nino. So instead of getting warm water rising up to the surface from Peru to Indonesia, we get cold water rising up to the surface in La Nina. And this uh, chart here, this uh, uh, sea surface temperature anomaly chart from uh, December 2010, a very good example of a strong and mature La Nina event. With this cold water running along the equator from Peru to Indonesia, the bright blue curve indicating that some very cold water there. These phenomena are basically the Earth sort of the Earth's thermostat at work. If the Earth is controlling its temperature by raising the thermostat, lifting the warm water up through the Pacific. Uh, it releases that heat then around the globe uh, through energy transportation. And then the cold water comes up after now El Nino, you usually get a La Nina, uh, the cold water comes up to the surface and that brings the temperature back down again. The Earth and the whole weather system, climate weather, is basically constantly looking for an equilibrium. It can never find it, the Earth never finds really an equilibrium, but that's basically what weather and climate is. It's uh, the weather and the climate of the planet trying to balance itself out, find an equilibrium that it can never find. Uh, hurricanes are another example of this, transporting heat from the tropical Atlantic in towards the polar regions, the mid-latitudes and the polar regions, and cooling down the tropics and eventually trying to find an equilibrium, but it's never there. El Nino is a very uh, similar phenomena as is La Nina. It's warming and cooling of the ocean in the Pacific uh, in an attempt for the Earth to warm itself up, to cool itself down, and overall to find a natural balance. So don't be particularly alarmed about it, although the effects can be pretty alarming down in the south. It's a perfectly natural sort of state, although there is some uh, evidence that with climate change perhaps El Ninos in particular are getting stronger though that is uh, quite controversial 
Now, before we go on any further, I just want to show you the uh, impacts that El Nino and La Nina can have. In summer, uh, it's basically a southern hemisphere uh, phenomenon. This is the uh, warm episode relationship uh, chart showing what the effects of an El Nino are. And you can see that in the northern hemisphere, north of the equator, which is this line here, there's very little uh, effect through the course of summer. Maybe it turns a little bit wetter around the Pacific coast of northwest America, but basically it's a southern hemisphere phenomenon. It turns wetter through the southern uh, Americas, uh, Latin America, whereas it turns drier uh, through Australia and in towards Indonesia. Wetter, of course, uh, where the El Nino event itself is taking place. But uh, through winter, it's a slightly different. Uh, it's a slightly different kettle of fish because there are more impacts in the northern hemisphere uh, through the winter. Now there's still a lot of impacts through the southern hemisphere. Uh, where of course it's their summer, uh, but for the winter it does turn uh, a little bit more impactful, particularly for North America. So for Canada, for instance, it generally warms things up from Alaska through uh, Pacific coast of Canada on in towards uh, the Atlantic coast of Canada. Whereas in America, it actually turns quite cold, particularly in the south. So stretched out from California through southern parts of the states in towards the southeast, Sunshine State, Florida, it does turn cooler and wetter in a typical El Nino. Often the sort of uh, snowstorms that you hear about, unusual snowstorms in the south of America, uh, happen in these uh, in these El Nino event winters. Now, for the British Isles and for Europe, notice that in summer there's no real impact from an El Nino, and in winter there's no real impact uh, across uh, Europe uh, from an El Nino. That's not to say that El Nino doesn't impact the weather through uh, the British Isles and Europe, because Basically, the weather is interlinked all across the globe. So if something is happening in the United States, you would assume it's got to have an effect downstream into uh, the British Isles and into Europe as well. The jet stream, of course, traverses, uh, traverses the Northern Hemisphere. So something's happening in one part of the Northern Hemisphere, it's got to impact uh, elsewhere. But what this is telling us is that there's no universal impact. These, uh, what we're seeing on this chart, are universal impacts that occur time after time after time uh, with an El Nino. There's no particular universal impact that's evident in either summer or winter uh, for uh, British Isles and for Europe. I say there could be impacts uh, from this El Nino, but maybe coming up, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, but it's not a universal thing. And uh, really, the evidence of that is from uh, two events. In not the 9798 event that I started off with, uh, that winter was very mild, exceptionally mild across the British Isles. Um, from that strong El Nino event. Had another strong El Nino event, not quite as strong as that, but another strong El Nino event in 2009-2010. And that winter in British Isles, and much of Europe as well, was very cold. So two strong El Ninos uh, with completely differing uh, outcomes for the British Isles and for Europe. And that just tells us, or it proves to us, that there is no sort of universal impact of an El Nino event uh, that is evident. Nevertheless, it, it, if it turns cold in the United States, uh, particularly in the south of the states, you would assume that that has to have some sort of impact in the Atlantic, be it either to enhance the jet stream and give us a mild wet winter like we've had uh, this year, or if it's from the form of blocking, of course, in the northern latitudes, possibly to give us the chance of a cold winter. So lots of uh, hedge betting going on there for what this could all mean for British Isles and for Europe. And by the way, something else I've got to say is that there's an a idea doing the rounds in papers, or has been doing the rounds in papers, that uh, the developing El Nino, if it happens this summer, uh, could lead to a hot uh, summer for British Isles and for Europe. Again, there is no evidence that it will lead to a hot summer for British Isles. It could do, but there is not a universal impact here uh, that says that yes, uh, the chance of a hot summer is increased uh, for us this year. So don't be pinning all your hopes on an El Nino uh, to give us a hot summer. 
So let's have a look at what's going on in the Pacific right now. And this is the latest uh, Atlantic sea surface temperature anomaly chart. Um, this was generated by NOAA on the 3rd of, on the 27th, I should say, of March 2014. And yeah, we've definitely got some warming going on along the equator from Peru uh, over here to Indonesia over here. It's not a dramatic uh, warming just yet. It isn't an El Nino uh, by any means, but certainly warming has taken place. And it's perhaps more evident if I show you the chart from the start of the month. This is from the 3rd of March uh, when it was much cooler along the equator, particularly towards the Peruvian side. That's quite a bit of cool water there. Uh, going back to the latest chart, you can see that through March there has been a definite uh, warming taking place and this is backed up by the subsurface uh, charts I can't I'm not going to show you the subsurface chart but there's a large body of warm water just underneath the surface of the equatorial Pacific um, and whilst that is not a guarantee that it's going to come up to the surface, it doesn't always. You can have warm or cold water underneath the surface and it never really rises up. Uh, it's a pretty good indicator that something is happening. And I think we could well find that warm water rising up to the surface through the next few months and producing an El Nino event. That's definitely what a lot of the models are going for. This is the... Uh, ECMWF forecast uh, for the ENSO region and by the way I should just say the ENSO region that's particularly important and it's so important that I'm uh, actually going to highlight it is in the central part of the Pacific it's uh, this area uh, just here um, it's not quite so important over here and over here it's this area that you have to uh, warm up or cool down to get an El Nino and a La Nina and it can be quite difficult to get these events as well I should just quickly say what has to happen to have an El Nino designated you have to have the sea surface temperature anomaly in the central part of the Pacific the so called 3.4 uh, region going above 0 0.5 degrees over five tri-monthly periods so what can happen with some of these events and has happened in the past if it never really gets designated either because you don't go above 0 0.5 celsius or you don't go above it for five tri-monthly periods um so sometimes you can get el ninos and la ninas weak ones uh, that are never really acknowledged or designated but that doesn't mean that they don't have an impact anyway going back to the forecast from the ecm uh, wf model Missing for latest one, uh, the blue line is where uh, El Nino or the Enso region has been. The red line is where it's forecast to go. And we can see that all members of the ensemble bar one are going positive uh, with the Enso region uh, through the course of this year. Um, we go to September or October uh, with this, I think. Uh, this two uh, Celsius. Uh, area is important here because that's as high as we got with the 9798 El Nino so if we go above that then we're talking about a record breaking El Nino one or two members of the ECMWF ensemble do go uh, that high not many but a few do uh, if that was happening it would be a record breaker but uh, really it's this one Celsius line that's important because that takes us properly in sort of moderate uh, El Nino conditions. So we can see that by the summer, uh, virtually all models by July are up into that sort of region, telling us that, uh, yeah, we are likely to see ourselves going into an El Nino through the course of this summer. And then things could strengthen uh, as we go through the rest of the year, or they could stay in that sort of moderate zone. One or two drop back as well, but... Uh, <coughs> they are very much in the uh, minority. But ECMWF there definitely, I think, is going for an El Nino to start up uh, this summer and then quite where we go uh, beyond that. We'll have to wait and see. The Jams Tech IOD model also from Japan has uh, an ENSO forecast. Here it is. And again, it's the same idea, but through this year we're going uh, positive with the uh, red line here. This is the forecast where the uh, model is forecast El Nino to go. And yet we're going up into pretty weak, but uh, uh, pretty weak El Nino territory, but El Nino territory uh, nonetheless. And we reach our peak somewhere around July. July is just here. Then notice it is keen, uh, the model, to drop things back. Uh, so by the time we get through towards the end of the year, we're actually going back in towards uh, neutral ENSO conditions. Now, this is quite unusual, but it did happen in 
2012, we uh, went into an El Nino through the summer. It looked odds on that we would go into a proper El Nino winter 2012-2013. But the whole thing sort of uh, stalled, uh, collapsed, decayed, whatever you want to call it, uh, through the course of the autumn. And the Jamstack IOD model is going for something uh, very similar this year. It never gets as strong as the ESMWF, and it drops things back much more quickly than the ESMWF as well. That was quite unusual what happened in 2012, but uh, it may have happened because we're in the era of the cold PDO. So here is the sea surface temperature anomaly for 2012. This is in July, uh, the 12th of July 2012, and we can see that, yep, we've definitely got uh, signs of warming going on along the equator in the Pacific uh, there from Peru, stretching out into the central part of the Pacific. Definitely a signature there for an El Nino. But notice this cold water up here uh, to the north of it, off the coast of America and stretched out into the central part of the northern Pacific. That is the Carl PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And I think what happened in 2012 is that, uh, because we're in this era of the Carl PDO, and I should say that the PDO is a sort of 30-year cycle of cold and warm. Uh, we're currently in the cold cycle. We're probably going to stay in it for the next 10 to 20 years at least. Not to say that every year is going to be cold with the PDO, but many of the years in the coming uh, decade or two will be cold uh, with the PDO. What happened is that... Well, if you've got a cold PDO, the El Nino is sort of fighting against it. They're fighting against one another. And I think that explains what happened in 2012. Because as we go through to uh, Christmas 2012, when in theory the El Nino should have been at its absolute peak. That is why it's called uh, El Nino after all. Little boy, uh, Christ, uh, because it reaches its peak around Christmas. Well, Christmas 2012, it's gone. Uh, the whole thing's collapsed through the autumn and we're into end so neutral conditions. But we still have that cold water in the PDO region, region that's important for the PDO up here. I think what happened in 2012 is that the PDO fought against that El Nino and in the end the El Nino could never really get going. Now because we're in the cold PDO era uh, we can't rule out that that's going to happen again. It is quite an unusual occurrence as I say and the uh, PDO is not as cold this year as it was in 2012 so there is a fairly good chance that this El Nino will establish and become mature but that's just the caveat that uh, with the PDO being cold it could fight against the El Nino and it never really gets going. Um, and I think that's what the JAMS Tech IOD model is signalling this month. It'll be very interesting to follow this and see whether JAMS Tech carries on with that or changes to another option. One more model to look at, that's the CFS version 2 model, and again, that's going for El Nino conditions to become established this year. We rise up above 0 0.5 degrees through the course of the summer. It never gets all that strong, but we keep on gradually going up and up and up, reach our peak around November or December, somewhere around 1.5 degrees above our so that's sort of moderate uh, El Nino conditions, not really strong El Nino but moderate conditions and then maybe signs that things start to dip away as you would expect as we get through towards Christmas. That is a moderate El Nino event being signalled by uh, the CFS model very very similar to what we saw from the ECMWF. There's no collapse there uh, that we see on the Jamstech IOD. So we've got the ECM and the CFS both going definitely for an El Nino to establish this summer and then mature through the autumn probably only a moderate one but an El Nino nonetheless where if the Jamstack IOD wants to lift things up into El Nino briefly through the summer and then collapse it all away as we get through uh, towards the last part of the summer and into the autumn very similar to what happened in 2012. Now as we go on with this I'm going to keep monitoring it so there'll be more updates because I think uh, certainly we're going to go into El Nino type editions this summer. What happens after that? We're going to wait and see. But I think we're certainly going to get El Nino type edition this summer. So I will keep monitoring. I'll do further updates. And as we go along, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the effects. Because the fact that we're in the cold PDO, there's quite interesting theories with this. That uh, the effects in a, in a warm PDO period, which we was in in the 1980s and the 1990s, when we had that very mild uh, winter with the 97-98 uh, El Nino. You know, that was the warm PDO. There is a theory that the uh, impacts from an El Nino in a warm PDO are different to the impacts in a cold PDO. Because we're in a cold PDO, it could mean uh, that the impacts for us, and particularly for North America, are somewhat different. 
uh, compared to what you would have expected through the 1980s and the 1990s. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in future videos. I think that's enough uh, for this video. I've gone on for a long, long time. Hope I haven't bored you. Hope that video interesting and informative. That's it for now. I think that was more successful than the first effort. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.